uh, I want to talk about specific features of Austrian democracy and how they help us to explain why in the Austrian polity, in the Austrian political system, for now roughly a quarter century, uh, a significant portion of, of votes in federal elections, Austrian, Austria is a federacy, goes into the pockets of parties that we may accurately label and identify as right-wing populists between 20, 25, and 30 per percent. This is significant. It's not unique within the peer group of affluent post-industrial Western societies slash democracies. But it's kind of, kind of the upper end to it. And it had started already in the mid-late 1980s, so rather early on, uh, similar to the French case with the then called Front National of Jean-Marie uh, Le Pen. So what type of, of democracy am I talking about was like the frame of, of background for all the arguments that we come up with and explaining for the continued, this is important for analytical reason, not the, the breakthrough, not the appearance uh, in, in, as a parliamentary party of such a party type, but its continued electoral success and fortunes, which are tied to different factors. But again, I mean, we talk about uh, one generation, right? Probably two generations of voters, and their stable support in the 20s to the 30s. This is significant. And it allowed parties representing that type to enter government on a number of occasions. Right now, it's also the case. We have our conservative, right-wing populist coalition government that does you know, the chancellor, the cabinet got sworn in nearly a year ago and it does still very well in the polls. It's backed, supported right now by about 60%, 6 out of 10 voters in Austria. So this is, uh, this is the current situation. Yeah? In continuation of something that had started in the 80s and then somewhat accelerated during the 1990s. Uh, the Austrian type of democracy is consociationalism. So you, where you abstain from the majority, majority rule in, on a number of issues where you form so-called oversized, often in the Austrian case, grand coalition governments. So this is a type very far distant from Westminster democracy and also from the political system you have here in the United States. So there's less conflict, there's more moderation, accommodation, there is, in other words, power sharing at quite a large scale. And power sharing in the past for generations, since the 1940s, the Austrian Second Republic, that we still stick to and are with today, uh, meant grand coalition governing and interrupted by a few single uh, party majority governments composed of the mainstream left, the Socialist, later on Social Democratic Party, the SPÖ, and its conservative, centrist right uh, counterpart, which is the Austrian People's Party, the OVP. Um, something happened during the 1970s and then expanded into the 1980s that Arendt Leipert, who, is, who had, was the first authoritative figure to conceptualize our, and, and who dom is still up to this very day, dominate, dominates our understanding of what consociationalism or what a consensus democracy actually represents, what it consists of, and what is the output, the systemic output that comes with it. And he had predicted, in case of a political system that works, operates in that fashion, where you have these super majorities and, and the downplay conflict, and there's a lot of, it's also bargaining democracy, in other words. If that goes on beyond the point to which the society becomes less dominated and described by deeply engraved societal or economic or cultural conflicts, because that's the reason in the first place to set up such a, a political system, such a democracy, because otherwise uh, democracy, the political system, its major institutions, society perhaps at large, it would just fall apart if you had deeply engraved conflicts, economic, cultural, ethnicity-based, language-based, 
or in other domains, center periphery for instance, and then on top of such a society, you would strictly obey and follow the majority, majority rule. Then there would be actually antagonism in the political system. But you can go too far in actually moderating these conflicts. You can, it's part of a success story, right? Economically and in moderating and getting over these conflicts, these cleavages. You can continue, of course, because this is a pretty convenient way of government and governance for the two parties, the political camps, that are actually time and time again represented in government and that share power, mainstream left and mainstream right. So they went on, and what happens in such a scenario, Leipzig told us, and he predict, predicted it in an accurate way, is that large segments of society become depoliticized. That's the situation of the 1970s and the early 80s, and for various reasons, uh, migration is, is picking up, the rate of migration, the frequency, um, you have generational changes, taboo breaking about Austria's involvement in the crimes committed by the Wehrmacht and National Socialism. Um, you have new uh, issues becoming salient, hot topics, nuclear energy, um, European integration. Uh, you have rising unemployment starting from a very low level. You have uh, to fight still inflation. So all that cum culminates in more conflict again and in a way the political system is actually able to, to manage that sort of, of new conflicts uh, and it expresses itself in actually a very democratic way. We don't speak about a crisis of the political system here because what happens is actually business as usual politics that voters actually, they, they still go to the polls Turnout still is very high up to this very day in international comparison, but simply there's a new offer. And the new offer consists of a left libertarian movement, the Greens, like in many other countries. It's kind of a textbook development. But there is also uh, an expression to the political right, which is a right wing populist party, the Freedom Party of Austria. That party had been around for a while already unlike many other right-wing populist or radical right parties. But within a couple, within actually half a year, it had transformed itself from a conventional, old-style, elitist, uh, honorary party into this new type of a right-wing populist party, which is pretty flexible, and I'm going to say soon a little more about it. That's part of its, its not charm, but its <laughs> electoral winning formula, that it's, programmatically speaking, pretty flexible. So competition, competition intensifies in the mid-80s and it breaks through in a very democratic fact, fashion actually uh, with new parties and new party types that take still not the lion's share of votes in multiple rounds of democratic elections but uh, they've been cut into the flesh of the two large parties that had dominated the scene for decades and generations. So why did the uh, the, the right-wing populists more profit than the left libertarians? Well, plenty of reasons, yeah? <laughs> but migration is one of them. But I'm going to say a bit more about that, a lot more about that a little later on. But it addressed, for instance, the issue of clientelism. <coughs> clientelism, according to development, developmental theories, is actually something that we should not see forming an integral part of representation, accountability, uh, parties and candidates responding to what voters actually want them to do in affluent post-industrial societies. Because for the national economies, this is a costly thing. But it's something that is an integral part that, that often comes with consociationalism and consensus democracy. So this is still around. That's one of the factors that benefit opposition parties that address, sorry, that address these issues. Clientelism, patronage, you know, securing jobs for, for party members uh, slash comrades. So you see the, uh, the adjusted line we plotted, that's research from, from Herbert Kitchell, uh, a dear colleague and myself, we took it from, from one of our publications. So this is the, vert on the vertical axis, this is the ex extent to which 
parliamentary parties in the Austrian political system engage in clientelism. That's what they offer to more or less narrow segments of in the electorate. This is not something that reaches out to everyone uh, in society, but it's for defined groups. Of course, the, that's a transactional thing. The expectation on behalf of the parties engaging in this, you need to have infrastructure for that, to make that, 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 uh, that credible promise that you would deliver on that once the other side portions of the sections of the electorate would actually have done their job, which is to deliver votes collectively. So, of course, for uh, we have it uh, the log GDP per capita, so how, how affluent country societies are, we see on the horizontal axis. And, of course, the more affluent a society becomes, clientelism we see reduced clientelistic effort and engagement, but it doesn't disappear. It's far from having disappeared. And Austria, it's curvilinear, and Austria is well above the fitted line, which means it's a notorious case if we talked about clientelism. So this kind of provided leverage for the talk of right-wing populists against the establishment parties, against political elites, that they would actually not act to, benef to benefit entire society, which they, of course, in a very effective way, of course, would portray as a pretty homogeneous thing, and we know that's certainly not the case. So in explaining the continued electoral fortunes of right-wing populist parties, uh, we like to refer to or introduce a market analogy. There's the supply side, there's the demand side, and then there are intervening factors legal instruments like, well, is there a public party funding, yes or no, and then it's set up in what fashion. Uh, is there, that's actually, that's here, is there an effective entrance barrier, threshold, 5%, 7%, 10%, 2%, 2 of the voter party has to secure in parliamentary elections to actually enter parliament, and then maybe benefit from public party funding. So this has kind of an intermediate role. In the past, when the phenomenon was on the rise, that in many, part, in many uh, polities, uh, right-wing populist parties actually started entering parliament successfully in the 1980s and then throughout the 1990s. When that started, uh, most analysis focused on the demand side, so they would portray these successes of this new party type that made us kind of uncomfortable because of, of its rhetorics and some of the proposals they, they like to, to put on the table. That this would be something triggered by change on the demand side. So I would say that can be an economic shock. It's all, all listed here. Uh, rising unemployment, the inflation rate goes up. If you're very unfortunate, both simultaneously goes up. Uh, loss of national sovereignty, European integration, international agreements hot topic now also in the States, of course, or a shift in cleavage structure at ethnic sectoral. So something the old political elites and conventional parties, they are not good at, at uh, or they don't eff effectively deal with it because it's a new challenge. So that, that all happened. That's why I spent a couple of minutes before actually elaborating on, on, on the changes. This is something that is about society uh, and not so much about political competition and the actions of, of political parties and politicians. <clears throat> Still, I would make the point that in trying to explain the electoral fortunes, 20 to 30 percent, more or less stable vote share for right-wing populist parties in Austria, like in a, in a number of, of other countries in Western Europe, we find the, most of the explanation. It's not an either or, it's a matter of degree. Most of it we find if we looked at the supply side of politics. And that can mean a collective leadership failure. Think of, of Italy in 1993 and the decades leading, leading bringing the country there when the, there was an implosion of the entire party system for not bad reasons. That's not the case, that's not the case in Austria. Everything else I listed here is the case, and it benefits 
the electoral fortunes of right-wing populists. If we have an oversized government, dimensional salience, so it's cultural issues and it's the immigration issue that not only since the the, the influx of, of migrants and refugees in 2015 into, well, I would, I would look at it from a central European perspective, uh, Austria took, well, it was quite a challenge, took a lot of heat throughout the process. But that's some, something that had been out there since the at least the early 1990s for other waves of migration. Uh, think here primarily of the of 60 to 70,000 refugees uh, that had fled the Western Balkans in the early mid 1990s. So in Austria, migration is a particularly hot topic, dating back to the early mid 1990s. So it's not just a distinction between social economics with the anticipation that if Volta well think about socio-economic topics, issues, principles, taxation for instance, where that should be distributive, redistributive, and how much so, the assumption is widely by scholars from different fields, uh, economists and political scientists and perhaps even sociologists and historians, that this would benefit the mainstream parties that had dominated the scene in the past. Well, if cultural issues become issues of cultural protectionism, group issues, grid issues of social morals and social political governance, how should the state actually interfere? But most forcefully, if we break it down to cultural protectionism and migration, this would strongly benefit parties of the far right and the populist right. So we're going to demonstrate very soon that there are reasons why in the Austrian political systems, in rounds of multiple rounds of elections, many voters discount socio-economic topics or bundles of issues and their vote choice is often informed by their perception of migration and more or less credible promises of political parties and parties past records in government and in opposition. So this is about parties competitive strategies. So the first argument why we should actually look at the supply side is the relational, sorry for it's a bit of complicated wording, relational dimensional significance or salience for vote choice. Is it socioeconomics in a nutshell or is it culturally defined? And uh, this is borrowed from, from Herbert Kitchell. So he came up with the idea and he tested it quantitatively, statistically. He tested whether the, it's actually the welfare state configuration that uh, regulates the salience of socioeconomic topics in elections. So his argument was if we had somewhat a medium ra range uh, welfare state, which we have in Austria, which is modeled after the German type, ba type, based on the insurance principle, dates back to a guy called Bismarck and Beveridge and others, <laughs> known here. <laughs> so this is one that is based on the insurance principle, continental welfare type uh, state regime, and hence it engages in some redistribution, talking about money in the end, yeah, and, and risk hedging, social risk hedging, but there's not much of it. But the system is set up in a way, and in itself it was a class across class compromise between the working class and between the capital holders, represented in Austria by, well, late on they transformed and turned themselves into, well, the center left and the center right. They had set up this system and to actually foster the idea of consociational and consensus democracy. So this is a consensus based thing, more so than in almost any other polity. Now with these, par with these parties, still the dominating parties, not being able to actually credibly promise after the election to completely change that system, which is just mildly redistributive. It's embedded in, in a very complicated and profound legal structure. Why would actually voters look into the socio-economic proposals of parties, into their platforms, against this system and, 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 and credible, potentially credible promises by parties, 
because, and I say this would inform my vote choice, because it cannot make much of a difference. It might be a completely important topic, yeah? But if you cannot alter it, the setting, credibly, then why, why should you bother? Why should you bother that much in your vote choice? No, you would look into another form of, another bunch of issues where you know it's important for me, it's important for others. On the topic, parties diverge. Yeah? They take maybe antagonist uh, positions on it, and they could actually promise there's going to be change, credibly. There are no veto players or fewer veto players involved. They could actually, if they stick to their campaign uh, promises and they get elected, there would be change. So, of course, that second type of, of issues, that's much more salient. But that's a number of issues. Called, we subsume it as the heading would be cultural protectionism. That's issues when you ask, the pollsters ask, well, which party is the most competent one to, to handle, to deal with the issue, people would probably think immediately the migration problem, yeah? the foreigners. They have the highest competency ratings. So that's example, example number one. So the uh, second, uh, the second um, influence it has, that kind of, 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 um, of welfare state, and the practice of, of coalition government, grand coalitions of the center left, center right, is that there's programmatic convergence. At times, not only confined to socioeconomics. In other words, I put it bluntly, they became too similar. And if you become too similar against the political space and the demand side, that becomes more, more colorful then you cannot expect to still take the lion's share of votes. Uh, the two together represented, they took between 80 for about 45 years, 40 years, they took between 80 and 95% of the vote, center left and center right together. That's spectacular. It couldn't go on any longer like that. And there is a sectoral cleavage. Uh, that's. To the best of my knowledge, that's an Austrian specialty. Uh, whether uh, so, we look in for the 2006 uh, election. A dear colleague at the university, former colleague at the University of Innsbruck, and myself, we look, looked into the sectoral background of voters of that that made it into parliament in the 2006 um, parliament federal election. What do we mean by sectoral cleavage or difference? We looked into uh, uh, classes of voters, working class, or we, we used a more elaborate scheme, whether they are business holders, they are they have they have their office clerks, etc., whether they are farmers, and um, we try to identify to what extent all these groups actually are exposed to market forces in their economic well-being, in their risk hedging strategies. And the, um, the result was actually quite thrilling because one out of two voters for the center left and for the center right were kind of sheltered from market forces. It was split in half, yeah? it's an incredibly high number. We talk about, in the Austrian context, farmers because, of, because their salaries or wages are largely subsidized by the public hand. There's a lot of protection going on. We talk about retired people, retirees. We talk about civil servants, of course. In an intermediate category, uh, we would also talk about students. So all these groups, more or less, partly they are sheltered from the ups and downs of, of the markets, of international trade exposure, of the economic and financial crisis of 2008 time, right? And then you have the other group, yeah, that are, is completely exposed to it and gets all the heat. And they would vote in, not, in much larger numbers for the opposite that time opposition parties primarily for the right-wing populists so it's one the, the ratio sheltered non-sheltered for the two like 10 years ago in the mid 2000s for the two mainstream parties it was one to one for the right-wing populist freedom party it would be three to one uh, just one out of four voters belong to the group of more or less sheltered individuals 
So there's a new, there's a new cleavage, one of the new cleavages, it's a sectoral one. Why do I stress the point of dimensional salience? This is the competitive uh, electoral space, uh, libertarian, so vertical axis, are you libertarian? In which values you embrace as voters uh, here at the aggregate level of social classes a and what is the corresponding location offers of values uh, by the political parties and uh, the socio-economic axis is the one horizontal here so this would be that's the left authoritarian corner that would be the right authoritarian corner left liberal, sorry for the labels, but I kind of have to rush through here, mm -hmm. and right liberal, yeah. economically speaking. What you see, it's the same time, mid-2000s. What you see is service workers and production workers in the expected location and corner, right? And then you have the old left, the social democrats or socialists, they're actually right there. There they are. They pick up their core constituency. Yeah. But still, a significant portion of voters in that very election at that time, all the data is referring to, they voted here. I, I didn't take that analysis any further, statistically speaking, but uh, some of my colleagues did. And it has to do with dimensional salience. Because simply, these voters here they give preference to parties' credible offers and commitments when it comes to the cultural dimension. And again, within, if we talk about the cultural dimension, it's about cultural protectionism and it's about migration and refugees. Um, so why is it the case? That's not the natural, naturally the case, actually. So I have to justify and explain why when we talk about uh, the, the cultural dimension to political competition and representation, why does it come down to the immigration issue? And the reason is in the Austrian case, except from many waves of, significant waves of, of, of immigration during the last 20, 25 years, that is plausibly one of the drivers, of course. But the other one is, there is even more consensus. Austria is not the consoci consociational democracy of the past. It cannot be. But there is a consensus democratic heritage, meaning there is far inter-party consensus of a number of, well, primarily governance of life issues that are hot topics that are actually structuring political competition in the States, for instance. Are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? You have to have, I understand, if you run for office or office holder, people have to know and if they keep you, they push you. Declare yourself. In Austria, that topic is not salient because still parties on the left and on the right, far left and far right, they have, they have, diff they have different opinions about it, of course. Yeah. How else could it be? But they don't turn it into a salient topic because they do not question the legislative, the legal current framework, which in that case had been a compromise of the mid-1970s. So it's kind of off, again, the same argument, it's off, off the table. Yeah? It's not the hot topic. And that's just one, yeah? stem cell research, nuclear energy, inter-party consensus. So all that, I mean, what are you then left with? It's cultural protectionism. It's, uh, it's, it's war on drugs, it's war on crime. And these are all topics that, for a whole set of different reasons, I will not go there and inspect it here, benefits the political right and even more so the far or populist political right. Increased salience primarily of migration. This differentiation between, I, 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 I like the, the abbreviations and wordings, uh, it's coined by Herbert Kitchell, so he talks about socioeconomics for him would be the greed dimension of, of voter reasoning and then there's grid and group issues. That's an important distinction between grid, socio-political governance, or so socio-political morals, and group issues, which is cultural protectionism and migration. Um, there is some demand for leftist authoritarian parties. 
And in many party systems, and until recently also in Austria, there was no corresponding offer. So that, was, that corner was, was blank. Yeah. If I go back, so there, will, there would be plenty of voters here in this area, but there was no corresponding party offer because the old left rather shifted heading north here to the, to the liberal corner, leftist liberal corner. So they abandoned this spot. And the, uh, the interesting thing that happened in the latest federal election a year ago was that the Green Party split. And it actually, the, the Green Party itself, it uh, didn't, uh, it, it's not represented uh, in, it was, it was a crushing defeat, they're not represented in government anymore, had been since 1986, big surprise. But the wing that actually, it was not even a wing, yeah? the single person that split away with a new program, he made it. He outnumbered the votes of the Green Party, which had been an established political force. Yeah? And so what was his... What was his winning formula? It was green ideology minus political correctness with more economically redistributive policies, or stronger ones. So he was on social economics, he was heading left, and fierce anti Muslim immigration rhetorics. Pretty different thing, but it worked out yeah? <coughs> at the expense of, of the leftist libertarian Green Party in Austria. Now, I take these supply-side arguments uh, a bit further because for a variety of reasons it becomes more difficult for any kind, any sort, any party type that is of larger electoral size. So political preference, the, the preference structure in Western European societies, it's not atomized. So we still see voters are packed and we can break it, can their preferences, what is important for them, in the policy domain, we can break it down to two to three dimensions. It's still socioeconomics out there. It's still socio-cultural uh, issues. And then maybe in the European context, it would be also well, your stance on supranational integration. The European Union, of course. Yeah? But that's two to three. That's, that's, that's not extremely complex, not yet. But still, the political space, it's, it's opening up. Uh, you have it becomes more difficult for political parties to, to rally and maintain relations with, well, more heterogeneous electoral alliances or to build cross-class alliances. So in the end, the effect is that we, we see we have a higher so-called effective number of parties, which means, well, the larger parties, they lose votes and we have a larger number of parties uh, represented in, in parliaments. Well, you have a different electoral formula in, in the United States, uh, but you had third party candidates running. If you had a more proportional, if you had a proportional, maybe even a perfectly proportional electoral formula with a normal a conventional uh, threshold to enter parliament and the Congress, the House, two, three, or five percent of the vote share, well, you would, my estimation would be you would end up with 10 to 15 parties represented in, in the House at least, if not more. Very fragmented. Yeah? So and this is of course something that also started to affect the electoral fortunes of the right-wing populists in Austria, because again that's a pretty pretty big party. So what they did actually masterfully is, and that's a painstaking effort to transform itself in its policy proposals and at a later point, I'm getting there in two, three minutes, they, they pulled another trick. Yeah, don't yet tell you which one. So their electoral, uh, they're, they're, um, they're losing votes. So I don't want to re repeat myself. And maybe the trick would be that you do not focus on the policy offers alone. Because what voters, still many voters are interested in is not only policies, clientelism we had, patronage, one way or the other, because you want to profit from the spoils, from the, the, from the pork barrels, uh, or you find it offensive yeah. and violating core liberal democratic principles and values. But it's a salient topic, it's out there. But there is even more, something less instrumental, less calculative, less rational perhaps. And that's the sphere, the sphere of emotions. Yeah. 
I mean, voters are also, like all of us, are even when it comes down to important choices, well, we are humans, and as humans, we are living our emotions, right? So it's about charismatic leadership, the charismatic leadership uh, element, for instance. Or uh, it's about invoking party loyalty, party identification. Some polity society is more important than in others. It's on decline, but it's still an important factor. It's, and it's about parties' appeal to their competence to govern, whether they have a past record or not, and how it's perceived by potential voters. And you can come, come up with the idea of, well, throughout these five segments, pillars of crafting accountability and trying to resonate, reaching out to voters, that you come up with new combinations in this, well, more colorful picture of party competition in Western post-industrial affluent democracies. Mm -hmm. You cannot stick to the old winning formula that you had embraced in the past, might have worked for a number of years, but you have to adapt it. And the right-wing populists in Austria, they, in a masterful way, they adapt at least twice. So once in, on average, like once in eight or ten years, there was a complete new, there was a makeover of how they try to resonate with voters. So the old for formula from the 1980s, when it had started under the leadership of a guy called Jörg Haider, was the so-called populist anti-statist, which meant against uh, hitting the establishment, anti-elitist, uh, being on the socio-economic dimension, being liberal or neoliberal, yeah. a right, actually what the right, what, well, almost what the Republicans uh, would propose actually, flat tax proposals. Are still still out there today actually, but downplayed in, in how they uh, sell themselves and their policies to, to voters. But in the 1980s consistently that was the economically most liberal party in the Austrian party system. It was rather a welcoming European integration. It was a secular, uh, it, yeah, it was a secular party um, for historical reasons and on cultural issues, it was just moderately to the right. It did not emphasize the immigration issue, for instance. Uh, it was relatively liberal on even topics like same-sex marriage at that time. Now that worked for a couple of years, but it got not quite replaced, but supplemented by a number of other uh, strategies, which meant on socioeconomics, they shifted to the left, they became more conservative, more radical on governance of life issues. Also for a number of years, uh, abor abortion, they tried to make that a hot topic and salient, failed, and buried the topic, but they tried to. But essentially what they did was the shift, emphasizing redistribu redistributive socioeconomic principles together with highlighting immigration as a topic and cultural protectionism, the two usually go together. That was the winning formula of the 90s that pulled over a large chunk of working class into their pockets. And they stayed there. That's probably, that's the bigger news actually, that they stayed there. They kind of lost for the political left in Austria. We talk about 30 years here and several generations of voters, the working class more or less is left, is, is, is left the political left, uh, it's rather interesting feature is it's unskilled workers predominantly are still backing the social democrats while it is partly skilled and skilled workers that well in masses time and time again vote for the populist and radical right in Austria. That's another fine distinction if we delve into class politics. So that's more could be more described as the radical right features of the 1990s. And later on, they would actually engage in portfolio diversification, addressing specific electoral vulner vulnerabilities, because they have a cross-class appeal, more right-wing populists, more so than, than other party types. So once they actually get into office and they have to deliver on their vast promises, they are more punished than other parties that could still invoke on party loyalty, that might still be given credit for, well, how they handled the economy or what, you name it, in the past. 
they have usually extended records of representation in office. And one of the ways actually to deal with these electoral vulnerability, it's cross-class appeal that they would always, uh, it was always that they will build up while they are in opposition, is to engage in portfolio diversification. Throughout the 2000, the 2000s, we emerged into a situation where there were actually two right-wing populist parties competing. And a couple of years later, it was actually three parties. So the Freedom Party got competitors from within their own ranks, two and then later on even three. And that was not the, they did not actually campaign and compete as a political camp, the three together. But they did it uh, non-strategically in a way, in reality, that uh, proved effective in securing as many votes as possible. And they did it by engaging in portfolio diversification. That one came up with a little bit of clientelism, the other strongly, strongly objected it. Uh, the, uh, one of the two parties will actually invoke the old populist anti-statist winning formula, the other one stick to the more radical right version of the 1990s. They came up with, their leaders came up with a different impression of, of leadership. One was charismatic and top-down and authoritarian, the other one presented himself in, in, as, a, as an elder statesman. So the leadership element was there, but always in a different fashion over all these four or five different pillars of representation and accountability. Um, now the question is, does it show? If we look into the class composition, or did they actually just rally the same, the same groups of voters? Uh, that's the more moderate, fresher, right-wing populist party at the time, and uh, that's, the, uh, that's the more radical version. And if you just looked into the support they rallied from different social classes, Look at small business owners and farmers, that one pretty strong, outnumbering its actually larger competitor, two to one. But if you looked into the vote cast by uh, production workers, it's one to four, by far the largest party. So this strategy of portfolio diversification, it resonated with diff completely different sets of voters and plausibly expanded its voter base under conditions of, to wrap it up, I, I, uh, uh, conditions of a intensified competition. And that was actually the election when you added up the numbers, at least for the three, a discount on the, on the third case that came in later and for which we don't have sufficient uh, data to cover it. But uh, if you, sorry, I should look there as well. Okay, five, five more minutes. Um, that, that was actually the highest number of vote share they took together. It was, I think, 32%, 42 parties together in the federal elections, 32%. So if you look at the electoral for, the support for the political camps, that was the largest political camp in that particular election. But it came at the price of, well, having a split and engaging in portfolio diversification. One, two, three different winning formulas. Now, what did the, to wrap, just a few more minutes here. So what, how did the, the mainstream competitors, uh, how did they respond to it? Well, the center left, in a nutshell, they tried containment with some success in the beginning, less so since the, the mid and late 1990s. The conservatives tried both things, containment, but we also see contagion. And that happened in the latest election. Worthy, I have to jump over this. Sorry, it all took a bit more time than I expected. That tried to actually stay a, a party machine, heavily engaged in clientelism. They have a huge party apparatus, and they use it for effective campaigning. That's a party that, I mean, Austria has maybe well, I don't know how many people are living in Bay Area, but what, six, seven million. Austria has a population of, of eight and a half million. The People's Party, so the center cons uh, mainstream conservative party, they have 600 to 650,000 voters. They have been represented in government continuously since 1987. 
you cannot be more establishment than this party. And still, under new leadership, the leadership of a 30 years old young man, it broke to voters successfully that, is, that it is not so much establishment that you might believe. So it sent out actually a conflicting message, but it worked at the polls. I'm kind of running out to explain why it worked. But what he did is that they maintained all the establishment features, the party machine features of the party, but they supplemented it, presidential style leadership personalized intra-party candidate selection. Well, in the States, that's business as usual. In Austria, it's kind of a novelty for that type of party. Uh, and it comes with, very interesting, the populist anti-statist rhetorics. So the successful elect electoral bid of the uh, mainstream conservatives, as of 2017, rested upon an electoral strategy that we know as the winning formula of the right-wing populist from 30 years ago. So you see, that's, that's where, the, where I would wrap up the argument, primarily, primarily, the electoral fortunes of populist parties to the right. It depends on supply-side dynamics and not so much on demand-side changes. And uh, that's where I would leave it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David.